This picture nearly destroyed me. I found this girl under a tree on the morning of the 29th of October 2015 in the Greek island of Lesbos. Far from the tree she probably climbed in Syria. I never knew what her name was. She could have been 12 years old. Maybe she liked dancing. Maybe she dreamt of becoming a doctor like me when I was her age. I gave her the name Amira, which means princess in Arabic. My name is Isam Daoud, a Palestinian resident of Israel, a surgeon who became a psychiatrist. I have seen and witnessed every possible kind of human suffering. I thought that my experiences turned my skin into shield and toughened me up. However, I was wrong. I discovered that my shield didn't protect me from the scenes I encountered back in 2015 when thousands of families fleeing war, persecution, hunger, and repression arrived in Lesbos. They sailed in in a floating wrecks and inflatable dinghies crammed in like sardines. My wife, Maria, and I were catapulted into this unfolding crisis almost by accident. I found myself performing countless CPRs with my bare hands. Some were successful and some were not. I had to confirm the deaths of children and heard countless stories of untold human suffering from seafaring refugees, Syrians, Palestinians, Afghans, Bangladeshis were all there with their bleeding mental injuries. Then and there, it didn't really matter where they came from. For me, the boundary between the living and the dead began quickly to blow. Weeks after I held Amira on that morning, her face was itching my mind's eye. By then, I have rescued so many children, but my feeling how I failed to rescue her and be there for her when her boat sank stripped away my freedom. I was imprisoned by my own pain and trauma. I felt powerless to do anything but automatically act. I was hell-bent in pumping hearts back to life, obsessed with the medical recovery, treating people like refrigerators that need to be plugged in. These trauma-driven reactions had a severe cost on me. I started to experience episodes of rage, difficulty breathing, insomnia, Nightmares, even when I went back home to Haifa, I continued to crack internally, like a fragile glass window. Amira stirred something deep within me. I started to lock myself up and sob. Sometimes tears would creep up on me while I am lecturing, talking, or driving. It was more than embarrassing, it was dangerous. It impacted my relationships. People started to abandon me. My colleagues complained that I was too aggressive. I am destroying my career. My wife couldn't tolerate me. My parents missed me because I stopped visit. They all longed for the person I used to be. One incident began to turn the tide for me. I saw a picture of a kid who I rescued. I showed it to my friends, and while I was telling them how he get back to life after a successful CPR, my wife Maria cut me off suddenly and said, Isam, you are talking about Ahmad. Ahmad? She knew his name. These kids had no names to me. Maria told us how after I supposedly saved him, he was rushed to the hospital. His gaze was frozen. His eyes was wide open. They had to close his eyes with a tape so they wouldn't dry out. He didn't cry when they put a needle in his arm. He didn't eat or drink. He didn't even respond to anything. It's like his soul has dissociated from his body. Maria decided to stay at the hospital by his bedside. Day after day, never losing hope, being there for him. On the third day, Ahmad started to respond. He
He awoke from his coma-like state, climbed out of the hospital bed, took Maria by hand, headed to the glass door of the department, touched it and said in Arabic, I want to go home. It's a catatonic state, I say to myself. The most extreme reaction to trauma. The overwhelmed storm at the sea became a neurological storm within this child brain, and I missed it. The child psychiatrist missed it. And it's because I was blinded by my pain and trauma. The message was loud and clear. Physician, heal thyself. It was definitely my wake-up call. I contacted my own therapist, and she said immediately, Isam, I was waiting for your phone call. I was following your work and wondering when you would call. During therapy, we discussed how it wasn't really me on the inside. It was someone dead who kept doing and doing and doing, burying himself with work, avoiding to think of his own trauma. Session after session, I was able to face my trauma. I was able to face my, my fear, my guilt feeling, my nightmares, and regain control of my life. And once I regained my calm, my previous state of mind, or rather the chaos, became clear to me. I saw my own cracks. I was able to save the child within me who was drowned in trauma and the journey turning pain to hope, began. Gradually, the anger disappeared. Amira started to smile at me in my dreams. I did indeed feel happier. My marriage became viable again. And Alma, my daughter, my little princess was born. For Amira, and because of Ahmad, Humanity Crew was born. A mental health aid organization that specialized in the prevention of trauma in displaced children and refugees. For the last six years, Humanity Crew had more than 520 qualified trained volunteers and therapists who provided 41,000 hours of mental health support to over 20,000 refugees and impacted the lives of more than 600,000 people in 14 different countries around the world. Venezuela, Brazil, Greece, Italy, Spain, Palestine, among others. This was possible only because the humanity crew was no longer about my personal trauma. My work transformed from trauma-driven reaction to healthy activism. The stories that now take center stage is the stories of the children whose trauma we try to relieve and prevent. There is no shame in therapy. There is no shame in seeking professional help because only when we care for our mental health, can we care for others and grow? <laughs> this realization was my healing and my message to all of you fellow activists and to the world at large. Thank you.